Emma Goldman was born in Russia in 1869, and in 1885, at the age of 16, emigrated to the United States. Best known for her contributions to anarchist political philosophy, she has been portrayed as both a heroic, free-thinking rebel and a wicked, dangerous nihilist. She wrote and lectured extensively about many social themes, including birth control, atheism, capitalism, free love, marriage, homosexuality, and women's rights. In 1910, when she published her essay, Woman Suffrage, only the women of Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Idaho, and Washington had the right to vote within the United States. Given her liberal tendencies, one would expect her to fully support the women's suffrage, but her anarchist foundation inspired quite a different analysis of the subject. We boast of the age of advancement, of science and progress, is it not strange then that we still believe in fetish worship? Worship of religion, home, and state? Religion, especially the Christian religion, has condemned woman to the life of an inferior, a slave. It has thwarted her nature and fettered her soul, yet the Christian religion has no greater supporter none more devout than woman. The most ardent church workers, the most tireless missionaries the world over are women, always sacrificing on the altar of those gods that have chained her spirit and enslaved her body. Then there is the home. What a terrible fetish it is how it saps the very life energy of woman. This modern prison with golden bars, its shining aspect blinds woman to the price she will have to pay as wife, mother, and housekeeper. Yet woman clings tenaciously to the home, to the power that holds her in bondage. We might think because woman recognizes the awful toll she is made to pay to the church, the state, and the home, she wants suffrage to set herself free. That may be true of the few. The majority of suffragists repudiate utterly such blasphemy. On the contrary, they insist always that it is woman's suffrage which will make her a better Christian and a better homekeeper, a stauncher citizen of the state. Thus, suffrage is only a means of strengthening the omnipotence of the very gods that woman has served from time immemorial. Woman's demand for equal suffrage is based largely on the contention that woman must have the equal right in all affairs of society. No one could possibly refute that if suffrage were a right. Alas, for the ignorance of the human mind, which can see a right in an imposition. Or is it not the most brutal imposition for one set of people to make laws that another set is coerced by force to obey. Yet woman clamors for the golden opportunity that has wrought so much misery in the world and robbed man of his integrity and self-reliance, an imposition which has thoroughly corrupted the people and made them absolute prey in the hands of unscrupulous politicians. The poor, stupid, free American citizen, free to starve, free to tramp the highways of this great country, he enjoys universal suffrage. And by that right, he has forged chains about his limbs. The reward that he receives is stringent labor laws prohibiting the right of boycott, of picketing, 
in fact, of everything except the right to be robbed of the fruits of his labor. Yet all these disastrous results of the 20th century have taught woman nothing. But then woman will purify politics, we are assured. Are we to assume that the poison already inherent in politics will be decreased if women were to enter the political arena? The most ardent suffragists would hardly maintain such a folly. Women who are at all conversant with the process of politics know the nature of the beast. But in their egotism, they make themselves believe that they have but to pet the beast and he will become as gentle as a lamb, sweet and pure. The American suffrage movement has been, until very recently, altogether a parlor affair, absolutely detached from the economic needs of the people. Thus, Susan B. Anthony, no doubt an exceptional type of woman, was not only indifferent, but antagonistic to labor. There are, of course, some suffragists who are affiliated with working women. The Women's Trade Union League, for instance. But they are a small minority, and their activities are essentially economic. The rest look upon toil as a just provision from providence. What would become of the rich? if not for the poor. What would become of these idle, parasitic ladies and gentlemen who squander more in a week than their victims earn in a year, if not for the 80 million wage workers? Equality. Who ever heard of such? History may be a compilation of lies. Nevertheless, it contains a few truths, and they are the only guide we have for the future. The history of political activities of men proves that they have given him absolutely nothing that he could not have achieved in a more direct, less costly, and more lasting manner. As a matter of fact, every inch of ground he has gained has been through a constant fight, a ceaseless struggle for self-assertion, and not through suffrage. There is no reason whatever to assume that woman, in her climb to emancipation, has been or will be helped by the ballot. It is just 62 years ago since a handful of women at the Seneca Falls Convention set forth a few demands for their right to equal education with men and access to the various professions, trades. What wonderful accomplishments. What wonderful triumphs. Who but the most ignorant may now dare speak of woman as a mere domestic drudge? Who dare suggest that this or that profession should not be open to her? For over 60 years, she has molded a new atmosphere and a new life for herself. The misfortune of women is not that she is unable to do the work of a man, but that she is wasting her life force to outdo him with a tradition of centuries which has left her physically incapable 
of keeping pace with him. I know some have succeeded, but at what cost? At what terrific cost? She can give suffrage or the ballot no new quality, nor can she receive anything from it that will enhance her own quality. Her development, her freedom, her independence must come from and through herself. First, by asserting herself as a personality and not as a sex commodity. Second, by refusing the right to anyone over her body, by refusing to bear children unless she wants them, by refusing to be a slave to God, the state, society, the husband, the family, anyone, but by making her life simpler, deeper, and richer. That is by trying to learn the meaning and substance of life in all its complexities, by freeing herself from the fear of public opinion. Only that, and not the ballot, will set woman free, will make her a force hitherto unknown in the world, a force for real love, for peace, for harmony, a force of divine fire, of life-giving, a creator of free men and women.